Hello everybody, welcome back to Find My Past From Home, the free family history series for genealogists of all levels. A place for us all to connect and a place for us all to kick back, relax and hopefully learn something new. So my name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past, which in a nutshell means I look after things like social media and community things and also video things, which is why I get to do fun stuff like this. And um, I'm not alone today, I have a very, very special returning guest. I have Kate Strasden of Falmouth University and you can definitely give her a follow on Instagram if you haven't already. Welcome back, Kate. Thanks for having me. It's always a, always a joy and a pleasure to, to chat with you guys. So thanks for inviting me back. I'm very excited for today. I feel like this is just one of the best things about my job is talking about something that I love with somebody like yourself it's just it's, it doesn't feel like work but I won't say that too loudly otherwise you know people might start to might start questioning me a little bit now before we get into things so in case you haven't heard or in case you've been living under a rock on the 6th of January 2022 Find My Past will release the online version of the 1921 census of England and Wales and we are all so 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 excited and this is one of the reasons this December, we are gonna be looking back a little bit on social media. We're gonna be talking about how our 1920s ancestors, how their lives differ from ours today. What's changed, what's the same. And so we're gonna be talking about things like employment, education, and in this vein today, we're going to be talking about the changing fashions of the 1920s and what this meant for your 1920s ancestors. So this means that by the time the census arrives on the 6th of January, that you should already have a good idea of what life was like for your relatives and family who lived in the 1920s. Be sure to say where you're tuning in from today. Do say hello in the comments. We do have Jessie in the comments, so please say hello to her. And if you do have any questions for Kate at all about 1920s fashion, uh, please feel free to add it into the comments. And it's really, really helpful if you can add the word question right at the beginning so we can easily pick them out. Now, before we get started, Kate, let's just uh, welcome a few people in the comments today. Uh, we've got Marion from a very chilly cold rain. I think I'm mispronouncing that, I'm so sorry. Uh, we've got Jackie tuning in from Hove and we've got uh, Anya in Freezing Fife. I, I, and Anya already knows I, I, I live in Edinburgh and I walked, went out for a walk earlier and I did not realise how cold it was. But what's the weather like with you, Kate? Well, I'm on the edge of Dartmoor, in uh, which is the southwest of England for anyone further afield. And um, so we don't often get very much snow, but but the moors can be quite chilly. So, I mean, it's cold for the south of England, but there, but I feel like a bit of a, you know, a bit of a southern softy because it's it's going to be nowhere near as cold as it is with you, Ellie. So I, I'm not I'm not going to grumble. Absolutely. And you know, I introduced you um, a little bit earlier, but just in case anybody's tuning in who hasn't uh, watched you on Family Pass from Home, previously would you mind just um going a little bit into more detail so what what do you do what's what's your role and where do you work yeah so um so i'm a dress historian which i think is the best way um i've always been interested i was ever since i was tiny really interested in clothes and fashion but i think it's that distinction between between fashion and dress where it's it's about all the different ways that people have clothed themselves so i specialize in um particularly women's wear from the 18th to the to the 20th century and i teach cultural studies to students at Falmouth university um which I absolutely love, and then I and then I teach in, in different across different platforms as well and write. So um, it's like I I could never have imagined. But like you were saying, you know, sometimes you think you have to pinch yourself, and I absolutely love what I do, and it and it doesn't feel like work quite often because um, yeah, I feel very lucky to have been able to carve out this little niche. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just it just gets to a point where you're you know you're do, you're doing something for your day job and you're like, is this actually work? Really? Yeah. No, it's good. I think it's a good a, a sign you're in the right job if that happens. <laughs> Sure. Lovely. Um, so in terms of what we're going to be chatting about today, everybody, um, we're going to be talking mainly about fashion and dress in the 1920s. And we also have some cool pictures to show you as well. And remember, if you do have a question for Kate, please do add it into the comments. And if you can add the word question at the beginning, that would be amazing because we can easily pick them out. And we'll see where the wind takes us. I think, Kate, we'll either do some at the end or we will do them as we talk. Um, yeah. If any do pop up and you see from our lovely community and you want to address that question, just just uh, just let me know. Brilliant. Sound good? Very good. 
Okay, so let's set the scene a little bit here before we start. So it's 1921, mm -hmm. we're into a new decade, and Britain and many other places are ju is just recovering on the back of the, the First World War. There's been a flu pandemic, unemployment, mining strikes, the list goes on and on and on. So if we move to fashion, for example, it, we can we can see that it changed quite drastically from say the late 1800s and into the early the early 20th century why did it change what what were the influences it's really interesting because when you when you look at the early 1910s so that that or the early 1900s you start to see signs of change so post Post Queen Victoria, there's that is often called that sort of that Edwardian summer uh, that was that we now look back on as recognizing that it's it's through the lens of knowing what's coming next. But there was signs of change. So even though the twenties are, are are a period of enormous shifts in the way that people were uh, choosing to dress themselves, that had started to emerge, certainly around sort of 1909, 1910, silhouettes were changing. You had designers like Paul Poiret, who was amazing French um, couturier, who was who had completely shifted the silhouette, particularly for women. And so there were signs of change, but of course that kind of was brought to an abrupt halt by the First World War in 1914. And that's really what prompted a lot of change in terms of clothing because you had women who were entering the workforce in ways that they hadn't previously well, of course women were working prior to that but suddenly they were entering into occupations that had previously been dominated by men so you had women working in factories and you had the you know things like the munitionettes and women working as farriers and and even as, as mechanics. So you see brilliant photographs of women wearing trousers for the first time. It wasn't it wasn't normal. You didn't have women, you know, striding about in trousers during the First World War, but but they wore overalls and things that had previously been very much uh, about a, a more masculinized sense of dress. So there's that that starts to happen. And for that to happen, their skirts had to get shorter. Uh, so you see them wearing bus conductor uniforms and that kind of thing. So that prompts that shift towards change in the early 1920s. What also happens, I think, post World War One, is that sense of the bright young things and the idea that suddenly the world is this place that they hadn't anticipated at all, and that you may as well live fast because who knows what's around the corner and it's really interesting I think post pandemic you know there's a lot of chat at the moment in fashion circles about people embracing formal dressing again because we had a period of of living Don't in go anywhere I know in a really different way and so suddenly people are people are the idea of dressing up to go somewhere um has has feels quite exciting again so there's that sense post world war one of um, that's where you have embellishment and colour and and those shorter hemlines, all of that kind of thing. So, so post a world crisis, you do often see a response in dress that is a kind of counter to what has come before. I mean, it makes complete sense given that you know, if, if I imagine myself as a an Edwardian woman wearing quite long constrictive clothing trying to you know if be a, be a munitionette or similar uh, this just it just doesn't really work and it's funny you should mention munitionettes actually and um, anybody who is a regular viewer of Van Ma Pass from Home will know that I've done some research into Dick Kerr ladies who were one of the munitionettes teams football oh, teams really? fascinating <laughs> and I can't wait to see that. what they were doing um yeah. in the 1921 census because that would have come off the back of some quite quite good successes in 1920. So yeah, but anyway, I, I digress. Yeah. So it makes complete sense. You mm. can't go into a workplace where you've got almost ornamental clothing, if that makes sense. It's not practical. Yeah, and I think there's 
you still have so so the sense that women were achieving a lot in long skirts and corsets prior to that um that's definitely the case you know that there, there is a a world of difference between what what we consider to be comfortable and what um 19th century women consider comfortable but i think it's just that the time was right for women to start dressing differently and that was the that was the catalyst really the the idea that um that they could um they could take part in occupations that had up until then been completely denied them and um and it was a it was a force for change and we've been talking a lot about women and i think i think whenever you and i chat about fashion we do tend to skew towards women but there were changes for men as well yeah, what, absolutely. What, how did that come about well similarly you have this sense almost of a democratization of dress in a sense because you've had for for so many men for that period of time you have had everyone dressing the same certainly for the vast majority of soldiers who were wearing that um that dress pattern uniform the the, the green surge Ob obviously you had officers that were distinguished by the the different ranks that they wore but for so many men suddenly dress becomes generic and whether you were um things that would occupation wise normally have marked you out you've got everybody wearing the same thing and and similarly you know when a lot of soldiers were coming back from the first world war and recuperating in convalescent hospitals they were issued a um not a, a bit like the demob suit that came later in the second world war they were issued a generic suit that they wore in these spaces and so there's a sense that maybe men can um the idea that class is not so clearly marked out by dress happens within menswear at this time and i think it's really interesting distinctions because because dress has always been used to mark out or had traditionally always been used to be a marker of your place in the world and those lines become really blurred and and as clothing becomes more widely available there is that sense that you can you can be a working class man but you can be interested in dress and acquire fashionable clothes and that's kind of given a kickstart by this generic dressing of of having to be a soldier that looks like the soldier standing next door to you yeah it, it makes complete sense mm. let's talk about trend setters so obviously today we've got we've got um fashion houses and we've got beautiful glossy magazines and we've got social media nowadays as well what about in the 1920s who were the trend setters who who dis well, I'm stumbling over my words, but yes, that's basically my question. Well, you've got um, you've got somebody like Coco Chanel, for example, who has a really interesting approach, which is that off the back of those really elaborate um, fashions pre-war, she didn't have much money when she started out. She had she had um, worked in a in a convent, um, like uh, working in a convent setting where she was sewing and learnt to sew in that context and wanted to set up her own fashion house, but she didn't have the capital to do it. And so what she did was buy cheap cotton jersey, which traditionally had been made, uh, used for making men's underwear and or, or sometimes wool jersey, and started to make these simple little two-piece suits for women out of, this, out of jersey. So a fabric that that's seen as being very working class or very utilitarian, she takes it into a completely different space, creates these little suits and then just manage to get them seen in the right places. So places like Dovey, the the on the um that that really chic French coastal town where you have people like the Seaburger brothers taking fantastic pictures of people like um oh, all the all the kind of socialites of the day wearing their fabulous wide leg pants and and these little Chanel suits and so you've got um the first time that people are going oh well that's not fashion as we know it that's a bit unusual it's very simple it's very sleek 
so Chanel does have an enormous impact and I know Chanel becomes a, a, a kind of complicated figure later in her career with everything that happens um, during the Second World War but certainly in the 1920s she forged this path as a very um, avant-garde uh, using cloth in a different way but you have some brilliant um brilliant designers like Lucien Lalonde comes along and um, Poiré is still very much uh, creating fantastic silhouettes at that point and some interesting women couture designers like um the Calosur for example so Calosur were three sisters uh French uh, French sisters who had set up shop pre-war and carried on after the war and they were they were known for thinking about dress in an unusual way and, and these kind of things trickle down so you do see uh, you might see these kind of really high-end designs but elements of it then get appropriated by different people um, in different spaces so then of course you've got um you have figures like Josephine Baker who um who I think it's important to mention she is the first black woman to have been invested into the Parthenon yesterday the French yeah, that's so amazing. um she is enormously influential at this point and uh, you know her aesthetic and her her general approach. She kind of captures that joie de vivre of the of the twenties. So there are those kind of figures as well um, that that just have this huge impact. And I mentioned the bright young things earlier. Um, this was a group of I, I'm sure lots of people know about the bright young things, but it's it was people who were kind of pushing the boundaries of appearance. So you had characters like Stephen Venables, who was a, a British aristocrat who really played with gender. He was um, a gay man at a point where, of course, in, in the UK, it's, it's illegal. And he dressed up in a, in a very particular way that would have been, that would have raised eyebrows. And certainly because he was of the social class that he was, he, he was able to get away with it. But they were a group of people, you, Evelyn Wall obviously wrote about them, um, that were just in terms of dress and gender and appearance and cosmetics were really playing with new ways of of approaching that kind of world yeah I, i've know i know a little of the bright young things but not a great deal it's uh, something i need to do a little bit more reading on i think but uh lots to explore there actually lots to explore and what about i mean i'm i might be barking at the wrong tree here but what about is it too early? It's not too early for film stars, is it? Would they be within? No, no. You do get time? so the nineteen twenties. You've got uh, you've got silent movies, obviously taking off, and and Hollywood it's, later in the nineteen twenties. Hollywood actually does start to become a thing because the filmmaking industry at this point really needed uh, consistent weather because you've got they didn't have the apparatus really to cope with. Uh, because it took such, such a long time to film shots if you were filming somewhere like New York where the weather was very changeable you would never have light the same on any two days and that became very complicated technology wise and so that's why the film industry in the in the mid to late 1920s moved to Los Angeles because that California weather you know is hot and sunny every day and they could consistently film um, without without worrying that uh, the weather might change so I never knew that yes so that is why Hollywood is Hollywood uh, but yes you start of course that moving moving footage is one of the things that helps to spread um trends and and for, for that it brings glamour to a to a broader audience people can start to see this um going to to picture houses and see these things these amazing new moving pictures i said at the beginning hopefully we'll learn something new i've learned something new good <laughs> um, let's talk about the trends themselves then are there any that emerged in this period i'm sure there are many many um are there any in this period that emerged that you'd like to focus on any of your favorite well i think particularly you know for for people who might be looking at photographs for example of um of their ancestors and and often a way of dating you know that you've got you've got the the key things that when you're dating photographs so for men it is much more about um 
men in this period start to wear things like or re in the in the 1910s men started to wear much more in the way of linen suits rather than your formal wool suits so so um slightly more relaxed suits um are always good for men and for women obviously you've got those if you were going to a 1920s fancy dress party i think everybody would have that sense of okay so it's it's your sort of flapper style dress the drop waisted dress um the possibly beaded possibly not but definitely in that sort of chiffon georgette type type um fabric um you've got the cloche hat which is the that sort of um cloche being french for bell so it kind of comes around the face in that sort of bell shape um you've got things like the beaded headband you've got mary jane shoes which are the other sort of louis heel with the little strap across um and you have the the that garçon haircut, the the close shingled haircut that again was a was a departure for women. First time that women, amazing actresses like um, Louise Brooks, who had had that very sharp bob that became her trademark. So there are those definite indicators of um, that you can say, oh, well, that's typically 1920s, um, and it is the first time that women. Um, are not wearing a corset although really they're still wearing because it's that very up and down silhouette so if you're quite a curvy lady um, they're having to squish the hips meant that lots of women at this point might not be wearing a corset that's controlling the waist but they are wearing a girdle that goes over their hips so in some ways that kind of that stiffening and that boning just slide southwards um, onto the hips to create a slightly different silhouette. Yeah, silhouettes are, I find it really interesting because as somebody who's a, probably, a, I would describe myself as a little bit curvier. I don't think I would have suited this sort of um, very loose waist and the, I, I don't think it would have looked good on me. It's tricky, isn't it? It's a bit like the 1960s when mini skirts were um, everywhere. It's, um, it's a it's quite a tricky tricky one to pull off when you've got something that is that doesn't have very much shape at all particularly at the waist um and i think it must have been there are wonderful um oral history uh records in the british in the british library for example of women who were in their 60s and 70s in the 1920s who had grown up wearing corsets and then of course 1920s everybody's casting off their corsets and they are horrified and they're talking about their brilliant interviews where they're saying I can't wear my corset my insides will um they really felt that it would that it would having having worn a corset all of their adult lives that to, that to suddenly stop wearing them would um would cause them some kind of internal mishap so it's a very interesting to to be an older lady. I think at that transition must have been really difficult, and so of course, that's where it can be tricky dating photographs because you might see you might see photograph of an older woman who is wear it still wearing look, looks quite corseted, but but that's because as then as now, um, you're less likely to be interested in maybe keeping up with those really fast paced changes in fashion when you're um, when you're a bit older. Not for everybody, but um, that's certainly the case for for a lot of women at that time. Would it might it also be possible if you were an, an older lady, for example, and you might not have you know, worked during the war, there may not have been any need for you to adapt what you were wearing, so you just carried on with what you were used to. Yeah, yeah, and I think there was those women had grown up with the idea that to wear a corset, not all women were tight lacing, so it's not it's not that kind of slight urban myth that all all 19th century women have got 16 inch waists but they were brought up with the knowledge for them that wearing a corset is really good for your posture and it and it's controlling your um your torso in a way that's actually quite healthful um and so it would require quite a change of of psyche i think to to change that at that point so yeah you'll definitely see older women at that period will will look 
different. So that can be a bit of um that can that can cause a few uh, stumbling blocks if you if you're dating photographs at that point. That makes complete sense. And what about sportswear as well? Now, this isn't something I know very much about, but uh, I was reading that sportswear became more prominent in the 1920s. What can yes, you tell me about that? It definitely did. You had uh, you had people like Rene Lacoste, the the famous tennis player, who once he had retired, started to um, started to bring out his own line of clothing, and he was called. You know, I'm going to get this wrong now. He was either called the alligator or the crocodile as a tennis player because that's the logo um, and then of course that's why he adopted that logo for his range of clothing afterwards i'm sure somebody will be able to tell me um and so the idea of so prior to the 1920s sportswear particularly for women but but for men as well was really just an adaptation of your normal everyday clothes you know a tennis dress for a woman pre world war 1 was just their normal dress but maybe with an embroidered tennis racket on the pocket or something like that what you get in the 1920s is sportswear that's custom made for particular sports so you get you get um the much shorter tennis dresses that women like Suzanne Lenglen wore um you get um designers who are really interested in things like logos so it's the decade where uh, one of the designers Jean Patou for example he was the first designer really to have gone for this idea of embroidering a logo onto his clothes which we now take for granted you know you think about kids and their branding um that's the 20s is the first decade where you've got designers saying oh that might be quite a good idea if I put a if I put a logo on my sweater or um so it is the it is the emergence of that sort of brand awareness as well and marketing through the medium of sportswear it's partly fabric generated. You have stretch fabrics starting to emerge. You've got some synthetics that are making sportswear more, uh, certainly um, more flexible um, in the 1920s. And so this is uh, things like swimwear, you start to get st certain stretch fabrics, still quite a lot of wool, I have to say. And my dad can recall um, when he was a young boy, there was an old gentleman who used to swim in the local Lido. So he would have probably been um, a, a sort of young man in the 1920s. And he insisted on wearing his 1920s woolen swimsuit. And yeah, apparently it was a sight to behold. I don't think wool, wool and water surely never go together. Um, but you do get sort of start to get that sort of swimwear emerging as well. And speaking of branding... Aha, there we go. <laughs> Put our logo on. Um, yeah, I just, I, I think you're absolutely right when you say that we, we take for granted where all of these little designer labels on our clothes. I, I'd, I'd never given much thought to why that. Well, not, not, not necessarily the why, but I think more, more the when. when. Yeah, how it actually developed. And of course, we, we all know that it's a massive, um, it's an it incredibly successful way that, that big brands um, market themselves and sell more stuff. Um, and and I think it was interesting that Jean Patou and someone like um, René Lacoste, and Cathy has brilliantly looked it up. He was the crocodile, not the alligator. He was the crocodile. Yes. Thank you, Cathy. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when, you, when we're doing something like this. You can't yeah. really just go and Google it very quickly. <laughs> So thank you, Kathy, for that. A lot of people talking about pho pho photographs that they've got. So Jeff says he's got a picture of a wedding reception in 1921. I bet that's cool. We'd love to see that. And I did see another one here. Uh, Linda said, I have emailed a 1928 wedding photo. Uh, working class, whole family included, haven't managed to look at the clothing. You should. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I do have a quick... Sorry, Sorry. Yeah. what you get in the 1920s it, particularly is that um, working class families can buy, you've got more ready to wear, you've got more options with department stores and so you can dress fashionably um, as a working class family. You might not have a lot of money but you can, there is that aspiration to um, dress in fashionable styles. I think we've spoken about the rise of places like Selfridges mm. um, on previous um, mm. previous sessions, but um, they must have had such an impact as well. But you know, yeah. fashion becoming 
I, I, I hesitate to use the word accessible, but it's more like you don't have to get everything custom made. Yeah, exactly. No, it is true. Things like paper patterns that were more widely available meant that you could buy fabric as cheaply as you were able. And then you could buy your paper pattern and and um, make a dress in the latest Paris style. Um, but it might be just using uh, a, a cheaper cotton or a, or a rayon. So it it does become more affordable more accessible i do i do sometimes wonder you know taking looking back to somebody like i don't know my great grandmother she was born in 1913 so she would have been a a child in mm. in 1921 or my great grandfather who was born in 1904 he'd have been a young man just how the world around them influenced what they were wearing it, mm. It's, it's it's just it's sometimes bizarre to put yourself know, in their shoes like that. to think about the the differences just in two generations um that that have come about like i i i, I am not i'm le i'm not i i i appreciate fashion and i enjoy the history of fashion but i am not the type of person who you know goes out and buys new clothes all the time Mm. In fact, I believe the last clothes I bought, I bought from a charity shop because I decided I wanted to buy some new things that were secondhand. Exactly. Um, and that's where I think the 1920s probably, I think we are starting to look back at um, a period that valued cloth uh, much more than we have in the last, say, 20, 30 years. Uh, the, we know now that we can't consume cotton in the in the way that we have. We can't keep buying the amount of new clothes and and the, and the kind of whole fast fashion system. And that you look back to decades like the nineteen twenties, where everything was was refashioned, reused. It was mended. Um, people knew how to darn, and the the whole um, the whole approach to to dress was that you didn't buy as much. But you and you looked after it. So I think there is a actually there's an awful lot to learn from from the way that people thought about clothes in the 1920s. I completely agree. And, you know, we're seeing a sort of resurgence now a little bit. You know, we've got programs like the Great British Sewing Bee, for example. Yeah. There's the focus on um not buying as much fast fashion now because it's, it's not very good for the environment and you should be thrifting and reusing and, and things like that and pe more more young people learning how to sew and how to knit and mm. i just think that's brilliant i think that's exactly what we need yes exactly um there was a quick question in the comments i hope you don't mind i'm going to put yeah. you on the spot here kate um do you have a recommendation for a website or book that might help identify when old photos were taken from clothes worn in the photos? It might help me find out who was in the photos. Yes. Now there is. Uh, right. Let me see if I can put my hands on it very quickly. <laughs> so there's a lady who creates um, a number of books. Uh, she's called Avril Mansell. Now you can probably pick these books up secondhand on so this is one of them this is her book that is called wedding fashions 1860 to 1980 and they're all taken from photographs that she has collected and then she talks you through um what those features are of the images so they're part of the shire book series and i think you would they're that you'd you'd be able to um, pick them up fairly, they're called History and Camera, and you can pick them up fairly cheaply. And there's another one that she did, which I, I have got, but I can't see right at this second, but is also by Avril Lancel, and that's called Everyday Fashions. So it's a really helpful, um, a really helpful one just for being able to identify, um, being able to identify clothes through photographs and and some tips so that's it yeah that's a good one fantastic thank you yes I was putting you on the spot a little bit there but I'm really pleased that you had the book to hand <laughs> um, okay I'm just scrolling back up now okay so um let's move on then so what was the next thing I wanted us to talk about I think it was disappearing trends so we've spoken a little bit about corsets what else sort of took a little bit of a back seat in the 1920s? Uh, the, you kind of see for a little while, 
scale, the um, the idea of the obviously the corset disappearing meant that you you lose that silhouette. Um, and so it's the first time that women start wearing a bra, for example. That's the um, that's the kind of headline. You you so there's an evening where you've got that kind of lots of embellishment, and you've um, certainly got that. But I think for a lot of people, it's less ornate. For most people, it's much more about a simpler style of dressing, and that is that's very new that's you know the first time for decades that something much more um simple both in in the silhouette but also the fabric itself it's it's a very different kind of approach to dress and and the first time really that that's happened for a very long time and imagine i mean i might be completely wrong in this but would the wall have had an effect on what would have been available in terms of materials embellishments that, that sort of yeah, thing to a degree yes i mean obviously not to the same extent as after world war ii but there was there certainly was rationing after world war one and and i think interest in in fabrics that were more widely available like like um the jersey with um with chanel meant that people had to be a bit more inventive about what they might actually use for for clothing um of course what you also have in the 1920s or what's starting to happen in the 1920s is that a lot of the um it's the kind of beginning of the end of the mass manufacturing in the uk in terms of things like cotton and they still I mean they do still carry on and, and they don't shut entirely until the 1960s but price changes and different markets means that that um that kind of where it was at its peak in the second half of the of the 19th century uh, it's that starts to wane and and of course with all of the employment crises of the 20s um that is that's a big part of what's happening and you mentioned a little bit earlier about synthetic fabrics as well. Um, I don't know whether you caught the episode of um, A House Through Time that was on a few months ago, and they were talking about rayon and the about fabrics like that. How did that they impact the fashions? They had a big impact because it meant that, for example, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to have a really nice sort of nightgown, for example that traditionally a very expensive one would be made from silk you could have exactly the same kind of aesthetic you could have something that looks exactly the same but it's made from rayon and that's much more affordable machine lace much more affordable so you have the ability to create similar kinds of objects uh, for a, for a fraction of the price uh, so synthetics were really important at this time and and it's i think what's always really interesting with fashion is that innovation um and that and the desire to find something new then prompts these trends going forward so um for a while rayon was really fashionable it wasn't just about um oh well it's a it's a cheaper alternative actually it was really fashionable because it was new and it was the it was the kind of cutting edge technology um so the sorts of chemical looking back to the you know if you think about the 1850s where you had William Perkins who had discovered aniline dyes um, and then that created that absolute craze for bright colors the same thing is true of the of the synthetics that that new is always exciting and so those synthetic fibers are suddenly really desirable and we've talked about this a little bit already but how do you think all of these changes would have affected our ancestors, your ancestors? Um, how do you think they would have, uh, yeah, how do you think they would have? I think it would have been generational. So again, you'd you'd probably, nothing ever changes, does it? So you would have had all the members of the of families saying, look at her hair. She's got, you know, she's cut her hair or, oh, he's wearing a ridiculous tie or, um, you know, the skirt's too short. So you, you would definitely have that sense of um, intergenerational frustrations of young people saying, 
oh, you you don't understand, you know, this is what everyone's wearing. Yeah. And on the other hand, the older generation. Um, but you also have a generation that is completely different because of the number of, you know, the number of young men that died in the First World War. And you've got all of these women who were um, not necessarily able to get married. And and so life is a very different, a very different thing for them that, that, that they could not have anticipated. And so I think um, you have that generation of young women who are having to approach life differently. And that would have included, um, that would have included what they wore. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I, it's, as we've already said, you know, it's sometimes difficult to put yourself in their shoes. But I think when what you just said about young women who, you know, they, they, they may be wanting to marry and can't because there's just not enough men to go around at this point or they've already married and they're sadly widowed during the war it's uh, yeah yeah fashion fashion plays into everything and what you what you also said about the fact that nothing ever changes about these sort of inter intergenerational yeah. you can imagine <laughs> that the kind of squabbling that teenage girls are having with their parents to this very day yeah. about what they what they can and can't go out wearing um i'm sure was was exactly the same in the 1920s it reminds me a little bit of um, in Downton Abbey when Lady Mary finally goes for that short haircut and they're all, what are you doing? Yes, I know. It, we can't, and we can't. Um, it's difficult because I think we have so many freedoms now in the way we express ourselves um, in terms of, of dress and bodily adornment and, and um, our own kind of self-presentation that they were really coming off the back that is that those were the last Victorians. Yeah. Um, and so those kinds of changes were were really um, shocking, I think, in lots of ways. People that they it, it didn't have those same. It was the beginning of those freedoms, but it didn't have, you know, for a lot of people, it represented something that would have been seen as quite shocking. Now, I did promise everybody that I did have some images to show. Um, what I've done is, I sort of did this as a bit of a surprise for Kate. Um, what I've done is I have pulled together some photographs from our newspaper collection. And I have done a few photographs for every year of the 20s. And just because I thought that would be fun, just so we can see how much it changes over time. And what I've tried to do as well, everybody, I've tried to do a bit of a mix of the more stylish fashion shots to more casual shots um, just so you can get a bit of an idea of the, the difference because let's be honest any fashion shots were probably a couple of, couple of years ahead of everybody else or at mm. least a season. Mm. Um, so yes let's have a flip through here and have a look. So this is from um, 1920. This is from the Tatler, so right at the beginning of the decade. And you can see that that's, uh, there's still a bit of a waist there. It's still got what's called the barrel skirt. So 1917, 1918, you had what the, this sort of slightly um, rounded shape coming out from the hips. That was known as the barrel skirt. And so you can, you can just see the echo of that. It's still lingering at the very beginning of the decade. Yeah, it's like it's like it's almost like a, a cross between the two, isn't it? Yes, um, being it, cinched in at the waist and and having a, a much freer waistline. Yes. yes. Now oh, I, I I can't even read the the captions I've put in for myself. <laughs> but it's starting yeah. to creep. You can see the hem. It's a it's a shorter skirt, and that's a direct result of of the things that women were doing um, during the war. So it's it's um, it's no longer ankle length, it's definitely kind of mid calf. You can just see it creeping upwards. Yeah. Very pretty. And also the neckline as well on the one on the on the left, that's a little bit lower as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's really interesting. And and this is I mean it's great to see um you've still got so the woman in the middle there is recognizably still a little bit Edwardian mm. um, in that uh, the lady that's leaning against the tree um, but at the same time it's much softer in that rather than wearing a tailored bodice she's wearing a, 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 a knitted she's wearing knitwear so she's a, a, a cardigan so there is a sign of of change there even though she's perhaps a little bit older but she's 
she's kind of assuming some of the modern trappings and a knitted cardigan was definitely um you see lady golfers in the in the um in this period wearing um knitted uh, the cardigan is a bit of a thing yeah i just think they're fantastic i love looking at stuff like this and this is from 1922 in the sphere and we've got some some an um, after sports wrap for summer wear and a fashionable <laughs> evening gown and isn't that gown just gorgeous yeah i love that and the feathers i mean feathers still very big um the feather fan fans are a really good indicator of of different decades and when you look at um i know this because i spent one summer cataloging an entire fan collection in a museum um and so it's amazing what you learn when you're like up close with the, with objects very specific objects and um i think the exuberance that that kind of sense of post war um exuberance that happened is reflected in something like the fan and there you have this massive over the top feather fan it's it's quite interesting to see the 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 contrast in terms of don't get me wrong the dress is beautiful but it's actually quite simple it's elegant mm -hmm. and then you've got this humus hungus fan yes yes yeah it's it's um they are slightly there's a definitely slight juxtaposition there isn't there of um but you can see her hair's getting shorter you haven't got the big chignon that you had pre-war um and she's got those um uh shoes where shoe designs are beautiful in the 1920s um 20 mm, yeah. 30s shoes are my favorite i think yeah they're really beautiful i'm one of those people who i don't like wearing heels i i yeah, heels when you've got them sort of this big I, I can't I can't do it to myself um but I think I would have I think I would have liked these because yeah, these yeah. are just little heels yes and I like a little heel I'm nearly six foot tall so um I do like wearing heels but then I end up um towering over everybody so um yeah probably a little heel is good for me I don't have that problem <laughs> I inherited my uh, my mother's height um okay so this is uh, jumping forward ahead another year to 1923. And these are these are definitely, they're loose now, these silhouettes. They are. And you can see there's real influences. The, the picture on the right there, um, real kind of artistic. You've got artistic influences starting to um, have an impact. I mean, when it comes to the 1930s, you have collaborations of designers like Elsa Scaparelli and Salvador Dali so there's there's that um there's still in the 1920s just just predating that um a real interest in um designers who are using fashion like art uh, and and not seeing a distinction between the two you know much later fashion is sort of slightly run down as being not 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 a real decorative art and it's in these decades in this in this early part of the 20th century you've got designers who are collaborating with textile designers and and painters and so it's it's really um it's really interesting that you see that artistic influence i i i do i do like to think that fashion is is art um but as we said earlier about things like sustainability and the environment i think nowadays all of that's got to be taken into consideration as well yeah uh, okay, so coming into the middle of the decade here, we've got 1924. Look at those fantastic hats. Hats. Um, this is, of course, still very much firmly in the period where you don't leave the house without a hat, man or woman. Um, it, it's just the height of bad manners. So um, right up until the 1950s, but so you're still right in the thick of it here. So uh, whether it's a... Um, whether it's just like a, a trilby style for men or the cloche for women um and then obviously different times of day you've got your occasion hat you've got your fascinator you've got um or you've got the cloche and um they're just a part of everyday life it's like going out with your with your purse um you don't leave the house without a hat i didn't realize that i mean i think i did but not not directly. I didn't. I didn't realize that it wasn't until sort of the fifties that it wasn't the done thing to leave it's, your house without a hat. It's it's just on the wane then. I mean, certainly post war when you start to get um, post Second World War when you start to get um, that kind of youth quake of 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 that that young generation who really want to just kick against their parents. 
Um, so it's you've still got older people then it starts to tail off. But yeah, it's um, it's really interesting, the hats, because we really don't think of hats as being anything other than uh, for lots of anyway, as accessories that you might wear to a wedding or. Um, I was just going to say, is this is that a sort of hang a hang up from from this, you know, you know, when before my partner and I got engaged, it's people going, oh, shall I buy a hat now? I know it's still it's that's the thing that people say, isn't it? And, it, and so so hats have become much more um, associated with these particular formal occasions. Um, and I, oh, it's a shame. I think there's some lovely hats. Um, they really are. I do love yeah. the idea of a nice cloche hat. I've got, of course, I've got that sort of short, slightly shingled haircut. I'd have fit right in there. I just could do a little cloche hat. Yeah, I, I, I quite like a hat as well. Although at the moment, I will admit, I just wear a bobble hat because it's cold. Um, but that's sort of a function over fashion. Um, okay, 1925. Now, this is, I think this is knitwear, is it? Yes, it is. Um, so this very much, very heavily influenced by those uh, styles that um, that Chanel. So if you, if for example, you were to have a look for a for a 1920s Chanel suit, this is that you'd see a very similar kind of style. So you can see how she's influenced um, sort of everyday wear here. Um, so knitwear, really important part of both men's and women's wardrobes. Although for women, you could wear it outside. Men didn't really. Um, knitwear for men was much more of a sort of at home um, you won't see men really going out and about in much knitwear although they might wear you know they might wear a tank top underneath their um, jacket um, but it's it's a bit more um, it's not really the done thing to be wearing knitwear um, out and about and just the, on the photograph on the, the left hand side look how low that is it a sash of yes some sort? it's is right it I mean, it's almost it's almost below her hips isn't it yeah it's really that drop waist is I think you're right it's quite a difficult um shape to wear and also I think because women are not so although I said you know women are starting to wear bras at this point but they are they were called bust bodices and they didn't have any actual structure to them so if you ever see a 1920s bra um they are completely unstructured they they don't have any shape to them or shaping, um, so so of course that that creates its own different silhouette. Um, uh, so I think it, it is quite a difficult shape to wear. And underpinnings, I think it was Christian Dior who said, um, without um, uh, without foundations, there can be no fashion. And that was when he had developed his new look in 1947 and and it was all about it was all about the underpinnings um and i think that's what what you see is missing from the 20s that lack of structure underneath completely determines what's um what's going on on top lots of chat in the comments about hats about gloves lots of people talking about gloves about hat hair and also jenna's yes on you you're absolutely right so this this particular um photograph uh, mentions that these of these clothes have come from Jenner's in Edinburgh um, and of course Jenner's is still there but it's yeah. it's closed it's so sad because it's just up the road from me and every time I walk oh, past no. it it's just empty it makes me really sad mm. um okay let's move on conscious of time um so this is tw 1926 and we've nice. apparently got a perfectly cut and tailored in this simple crepe de chine mm -hmm. jumper completed with a tie of striped taffeta it hails from the salons of dickens and jones regent street yeah nice dickens and jones was a was a big um big department store in london uh, that had been there for a long time um you can see those masculine influences so this is the um and there were some tensions around the idea of of women dressing as men at this time uh you had a very famous book that was written by um a woman called radcliffe hall which was called The Well of Loneliness. And it was the first sort of um, lesbian tract, really, where she's, I mean, it's, don't know, it's this very depressing book. Um, she's basically talking about how hard it is to be um, the kind of the kind of awfulness of her identity at that point. Um, but, you know, you see pictures of her and she's got her hair cut in a very much a sort of man's hairstyle and, um, 
she used to wear a monocle a lot and dress up in tweed suits. Um, there were lots of anxieties about women starting to take over men's roles and um, and dressing like men that was not acceptable. And you see just a little hint of that here with the tie and the shirt and the and the bobbed hair. Um, so there were there were anxieties about that blurring of gender roles in the twenties that came off the back of the war. Yes, and some some of the research I've done over the past couple of months. So I've already mentioned the the footballers and the fact that you know the FA banned women from playing on uh, their grounds in I think it was I want to say 1922 that came into effect, and then also you, you've you've also got um, female police officers. There were well over a thousand of them in uh, 1919 and then by I think again it was something like 1922 something like that maybe a little bit later uh, that was cut down to a very small number of I think it was a I think it was a double digit figure it was quite small really? gosh that's really interesting and of um, course you will not see women wearing trousers at this point apart from um I mentioned Dovey and um that French um but that was very sort of um it was very much in the context of leisure. So if you're if you're sort of parading along the boardwalk at um, the Riviera, then you can wear your wide leg beach pants, and that's acceptable. But but women did not wear trousers in any other space until much later. So um, yeah, skirts only. Yeah, we've got some some so these sort of skirt suits. Yes, yes, a skirt suit. So matching matching probably tweed. Um, this is the beginning of that idea that we still have of this idea, uh, notion of Britishness, isn't it, of, of tweed. What's interesting about tweed is it started out as very much a kind of working class cloth because it was a cloth that was worn by shepherds and um, people working on the hills because it was very robust and waterproof. Um, and then it got appropriated by the aristocracy in the late 19th century so that by the 1920s, the tweed suit is very kind of... Um, twin set and pearl sort of British sign of, of the British country set um, that you can see here. Oh, it's just so much to show. And I, I, had to, I had to include a few wedding photographs because I just think 1920s wedding fashions were yeah. just the height for me. Yeah. They are the they are most extra, thing. Aren't they, in all respects. From the massive bouquets to those um, to the to the way the veil was arranged, they're very very distinctive, and um, yeah, and complicated as well. When you see them in real life, the dresses are very um, they're not quite so straightforward. Often there's a lot of there's a lot going on with the 1920s wedding. Yeah, lots and lots and lots. Um, last but not least, 1929, and again we've got some some beautifully. They're not quite structured, but they're getting there. Um, yeah. Yes, a slight change, yes. just parking towards that um, the shifts that that were going to take place in the nineteen twenty and the nineteen thirties. And you can see, for example, one of those is the is the double breasted suit that you can see the the guy wearing there. That's very much something that was popular in the thirties, and so it's just shifting towards that next next change of style. It's amazing how much from just a few slides we've seen. The fashions change yes. over yeah, the course of a decade. That short space of time, yeah. Just amazing. Well, those are the end of my slides, so I can get rid of those now. Um, I think we are sort of, yes, we're just after five o'clock, so we should probably start wrapping up. But before we do, Kate, there was just one more thing I wanted to ask you, and it's not fashion related, but I wanted to ask you, what are you most excited to find out in the 1921 census? What, what what mystery could it solve for you? What could it tell you about your ancestors? What do you think I, it's going to tell you? I love the idea of, because I think it's that, it's almost just out of reach, the 1920 census, isn't it? You know, my gran, my gran was born in 1922. And so it's that generation that are almost, I had a very close relationship with her. And so it would be her mother and her, so it's just in her kind of in her lifetime and I think that's what's so tantalizing about the 1921 census is that it is you know for many people it will be maybe their parents or their grandparents lifetimes and it, and it's a world that we were just um just on the edge of and so being able to learn a little bit more about that generation that is that is almost within reach is um is really exciting yeah absolutely it's just 
I'm so excited for it. We're all excited. Anyway, um, we are we are past five o'clock now. So I think the only things left for me to say are now tomorrow, um, Rose from the BNA team, she is returning for a pre-recorded session. She's going to be building on what Kate and I have talked, talked about today. She's going to be talking about 1920s youth culture and flappers, cosmetics, hair, all of that. So make sure you tune in for that four, same time tomorrow, four o'clock UK time. Jen is back on Friday for Friday's Live, so make sure you tune in for that as well. And remember to give Kate a follow on Instagram if you are on Instagram. It is well worth a follow. Honestly, you just you just see so much. Oh, I'm doing an advent calendar. I'm doing an advent calendar story at the moment. 1950s ski lodge crime. You know, it's all going on. <laughs> uh, quick question in the comments before we go. How is the dress diary project coming along? Oh, Victoria, um, it's going really well. I'm at the edit stage. Um submitted uh, so I've already submitted manuscript edit stage and um it should be published spring summer 23 there we'll have to have you back to talk about that because we're all we're all invested now <laughs> in <this process. laughs> um okay it's been an absolute pleasure I could just I could go on talking to you about this for just hours and hours but you know we've all got to go and get our tea and carry on with our day and uh you know find some more ancestors and some more stories oh, um thank you for having me everyone and thanks for coming along yes thank you thank you everybody so much for watching take care of yourselves and we will see you same time same place tomorrow for rose's talk on youth culture okay take care everybody bye bye <laughs>